Number five on this list is Happy Science. Kind of a fun name that they have there for sure, but maybe not the funnest of cults. Ranker says, if you're looking for a mashup of world religions, new age, hokum, far-right nationalism, and infrastructure spending, then Japanese cult Happy Science is for you. It was founded in 1986 by Ryoho Okawa, a former salaryman who was enraptured by a group called the God Light Association. He soon formed his own cult of personality called Science of Happiness and changed its name to Happy Science a few years later. Okawa believes he is the human incarnation of a supreme being called El Kanter who combines Christ Christ, Buddha, Muhammad, and every other prophetic deity to create a nine-dimensional heaven with him at the head. He's also created a massively complex mythology of New Age nonsense while simultaneously founding a political wing called the Happiness Realization Party. Here's where the strangeness goes into overdrive though. As his party advocates a vicious Japanese nationalism devoted to denying historical cruelties, advocating conflict with China and North Korea and rebuilding Japan's infrastructure. The group claims to have 12 million members around the world, has a multimedia arm, and enjoys tax-exempt status in the US. So basically, if it was up to this group, Japan would be invading China and North Korea and probably well on its way to starting World War III. So yeah, definitely not one that you want to be a part of because that could obviously get very bad very quickly. Not to mention you need to worship this dude who believes that he's the human incarnation of all these cool people. I mean, if he actually is the human reincarnation of all of those people, then that's freaking awesome, but... Come on guys, I think the likelihood that this dude is Jesus as well as Buddha is pretty low. Number four on this list is the Brethren. Yeah, so joining this cult really would just be the worst, guys. You just need to give up so much to do it. Ranker says, also known as Body of Christ and Garbage Eaters, the Brethren are an apocalyptic offshoot of the 70s Jesus movement, eschewing worldly possessions and earthly pleasures to purify themselves for the coming end of the world. Brethren members essentially live as vagrants doing odd jobs to survive, eating trash, avoiding bathing and medical treatment, and giving whatever money they do make to the group. They also forbid dancing and laughing until the return of Jesus, bar members from communicating with family, and forbid contact between binary genders. Group founder Jim Roberts passed in December 2015, leaving the future of the secretive cult unclear. You literally need to give up everything in your entire life life to get ready for when Jesus returns. I just don't get this one, guys. Like, maybe it's because I'm not part of this cult, but I guess it isn't clear to me why Jesus would be angry that you have earthly possessions. Like, what does he have against you having the occasional knickknack, you know? Also, there's the whole thing where you literally need to eat garbage. I don't think that they're joking about that, guys. Like, you will be eating scraps if you join this cult. Never having a warm meal again, that's about as terrifying as it can get. Number three on this list is the fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You guys might be familiar with this one right now as it's currently very popular. Netflix just released a documentary about this cult, so if you want a more in-depth summary of what went down, definitely go check that out. Ranker says that this cult was an offshoot of Mormonism that's constantly in the news for unsavory reasons. FLDS openly embraces polygamy, which the mainstream LDS outlawed a century ago. The group has anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 members in rural Utah and Arizona with the group having almost total control of two small, linked border towns in two states. While Mormon splinter groups had been around long before, the FLDS was incorporated in 1991 by a group of men who had been excommunicated by the church. They went through a range of leaders who all declared themselves prophets until being taken over by Rulon Jeffs in 2002. He passed shortly thereafter and his son Warren took over. It was under Warren Jeffs that the FLDS practices of child marriage, bigamy, Says racism, abandonment of teenage boys all became public knowledge. Jeffs was sent to prison in 2007 but continues to be the de facto head of the church while his successors squabble for power. This cult certainly isn't as powerful as it once was and you have to imagine that as time goes on and more people are educated on what this cult did in the past, that will continue on a downward trajectory. But for now, they still aren't totally finished and if you wanted to, then you could join this group. Absolutely do not 
not do that though because these people get up to some very weird and often illegal things. Like the leader was literally sent to jail and is still there rotting away. I would not want to get myself into a situation where I'm anywhere close to the people that support that guy. Number two on this list is the new Wabian Nation. This one is absolutely nuts, guys, so strap in. Ranker says, formerly known as the United New Wabian Nation of Moors, this is a cult of personality based around founder Dwight York. Combining Christianity, ancient Egyptian iconography, African rituals, and a belief that aliens are coming, the nation believes that 144,000 chosen people will be taken away in a flying city, spirited to Orion, to prepare for the final fight against Satan. Shockingly, York's mishmash of New Age concepts, black power militancy, and ancient Egyptian religion caught on in both the hip-hop community and in rural Georgia, where York built a massive compound made with donated funds. York's mythology grew incorporating cloning, racial theory, cosmology, anti-government conspiracies, and linguistics. Even as the cult grew, York was under investigation, and he was finally detained in 2002 for running a massive human trafficking ring comprising as many as 1,000 individuals. He was sent to prison for life and his compound was seized and demolished. The group still exists, though in much smaller numbers. If we just ignore all of the human rights violations for a second, which we shouldn't by the way, but let's just do it anyways for one moment, then at the best possible case scenario, you join this cult and then dedicate your life preparing for a battle with Satan that you may not ever have because not only is that crazy, but you might not even be in the 140,000 people who gets picked to have said battle with Satan. Like, this just doesn't make any sense at all, guys. Then we add back on all of those human rights violations and all the other stuff that York was sent to jail for, and you get one sick and twisted cocktail that is this cult. Number one on this list is Church Universal and Triumphant. Yet another cult of personality in New Age clothes, the CUT was founded in 1970 as an offshoot of a different movement, Summit Lighthouse. Founder Elizabeth Clare Prophet pitched herself and her husband as messengers of the Ascended Masters, a set of spiritually awakened ancient beings central to the Theosophy belief system. They also threw in elements of Christian science, the, the I Am movement, and Mormon-style doomsday prepping. The Prophets grew wealthy enough to buy large spreads in the Santa Monica Mountains and Montana, while members drove themselves into debt building fallout shelters and paying huge sums of money to reserve a spot in the post-nuclear conflict society. The church was also accused of making illicit straw purchases and of using sleep deprivation against members who attempted to leave. In ill health, the prophet retired in 1999 and passed 10 years later. Since then, the church has gone through legal problems and succession squabbles, but members still meet on a regular basis. So yeah, just join this cult if you want to potentially get tortured from sleep deprivation. Oh, and while we're torturing you, we're also gonna take all your money and invest it into some underground bunker that you'll probably never use. If that doesn't sound like an excellent use of time and money to you, which it probably shouldn't, then I really wouldn't recommend joining this cult. Number five on this list is Sarah Edmondson. Sarah Edmondson is a Canadian actress who's known for her roles on The Vow, Geronimo Stilton, and At Home in Mitford. She's also known for having been part of a cult. Listverse says, Sarah Edmondson, a young actress, had been searching for a newfound purpose in her life when she boarded a cruise designed to explore spirituality. She did not know that it was a front for the infamous cult, NXIVM, nor did she know that it would dictate the next 12 years of her life. During her time in the cult, she climbed the ladder into a position that gave her immense wealth. The power she found herself in was exciting, and it was not until she was inducted into the secret subgroup of the cult that it didn't feel like a positive experience. When she was branded with the letters of the founding members of the cult, she decided that she'd had enough. She became a whistleblower on the cult, drawing worldwide attention to the famous actors and actresses involved in the pyramid scheme and trafficking cult. Sarah Edmondson went on to write a book, 
scarred, but it's a bit troubling. She lured many young women into the cult, but her book seems strangely void of guilt or remorse. Instead, her writing is self-indulgent and gossip-filled. Though she was certainly abused within the cult, she was not blameless for her own wrongdoings. Interesting. If what Listverse says is true, then Sarah might not have been completely from blame for some of the stuff that happened in this cult. I looked into some of what the cult did, and it was not good, guys. This cult was rotten to the core. The founder, Keith Rainier, finally got his though. He was recently sentenced to 120 years in prison. Number four on this list is Brielle Decker. Brielle's story is one that is truly moving. Brielle is a true hero. Not only did she escape the fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints cult, she established a refuge at the cult headquarters after the cult leader was arrested. FLDS, a polygamous cult, was led by Warren Jeffs. During his reign, he forced approximately 80 women and children into marriages. Brielle, who was born into the FLDS, knew from a young age that she would be forced to marry the middle-aged man. When she turned 18, he prepared their wedding ceremony and she had no choice but to go along with it. Around this time, the FBI charged Jeffs for forcing an underage girl into marriage and later conducted a raid on the FLDS compound where they discovered just how many children Jeffs had forced into marriage. Jeffs was, of course, charged and sentenced to 20 years in prison. The $100 million FLDS fund, which was seized by the government, was partially given to Brielle to buy Jeffs mansion and turn it into a refuge for victims. Even though she went through some really horrible stuff, Decker's character remained intact. And now she's taken the experience that happened to her and turned it into a way to help all the others who were affected. Big shout out to Brielle. Number three on this list is Anna LeBaron. A lot of people get poached at a young age to join cults. It's pretty easy to do that poaching if you can start from birth. Anna LeBaron's father, Irville, was the leader of a cult that's been linked to over 20 murders. Her father had 13 wives and over 50 children between them all. Anna, in the book that she's written called The Polygamist's Daughter, details how she and the other children were made to feel isolated and were forced to work 12-hour workdays. Her father was wanted by the FBI for organizing the murders of over 10 people. He was eventually captured, but even after his capture, his followers continued to kill. He had made a master kill list and his devout troops were following it. Luckily, at the age of 13, Anna was able to escape with the help of her sister. She went on to go to college and live a relatively normal life, which is kind of crazy to think about considering how her existence started. Number two on this list is Clary Ashman. Clary, as many followers of cults are, was poached at a young age and just found herself involved in something that she never wanted to be a part of. Listverse says, Claire Ashman grew up in the very traditional Catholic society of St. Pius X. When she left her family and started life outside the strictly Latin faith, she was confused and unsure of herself. In many ways, she was clueless and uneducated by her family. That explains why, when she turned 15, she was not aware that it was creepy for a 27-year-old man to show interest in her. Unfortunately, without healthy relationships for her to learn from, Claire accepted a marriage proposal from the man. Shortly after their marriage, her husband discovered the order of St. Charbel and Claire found herself smack in the middle of a doomsday cult. Claire was even more confused when she was selected as a princess of the church and was destined to marry the cult leader. For six years, she grappled with the controlling hand of the church and her husband until one day she got her hands on a book called The Beautiful Side of Evil, which first unveiled the term cult to Claire. She understood at once that she was in a cult and began learning about how to open a bank account, how to sign a lease on an apartment, and how to be free. After learning more about how to survive outside the cult, Claire escaped. She now hopes her retelling of her experiences can help other women find a better life. Imagine getting married to this guy who basically groomed you from when you were 15 and then getting told that you're actually going to get married off to some other dude. Meanwhile, you have no idea what a bank account is or like actual real life is. It's so good that she found that book and was able to realize that this isn't how life is supposed to go. I can't imagine how bad things would have got if she had never found it. And finally, number one on this list is Rebecca Stott. Rebecca is once again another story of someone being born into this and just thinking that this is what life is like until finally being told otherwise. Listopher says, author of In the Days of Rain, A Daughter, A Father, A Cult, Rebecca opens up about her upbringing. She and her families were members of a religious cult, the Exclusive Brethren. 
In an interview with NPR, Rebecca stated that rules were enforced with intense interrogations about your sins and that punishments would often include isolation that could go on for weeks. Rebecca details the anger she was forced to bottle up and how silent she was forced to be around men. When the cult leader, Jim Taylor Jr., was found sleeping with a young married member, the entire cult ruptured. 8,000 members left the cult, including Rebecca's family. But that did not mean her hardships were over. Rebecca described the overwhelmingness of the outside world with a sense of vertigo. All the rules of her old life spun around as she took more and more steps away from their binds. It took a very long time for Rebecca to grow less shell-shocked by the world, and to this day she cannot bring herself to open a Bible, which makes a lot of sense. By the time Rebecca was just six, she had undergone at least 3,000 hours of forced Bible study. Being born into something like that must be so hard. I imagine that she's dealt with feelings of inadequacy her whole life. Also getting shoved inside an isolated room for time if you misbehaved is pretty whack, guys, and not something that anybody should want to be a part of. Very glad that Rebecca managed to make it out with her life still left to live. Coming in at number five, Rosemary's Baby. Roman Polanski's masterpiece, Rosemary's Baby, set the standard for many cultist horror movies, particularly in the way it reveals the cult, using a steady and slow build and paranoia, confusing us as to what exactly is even happening. This 1968 horror stars Mia Farrow and chronicles the story of a pregnant woman who suspects that an evil cult wants to take her baby for use in their rituals. However, it is quickly revealed that her husband has made a deal with the devil for success in his acting career, and the price is offering up his wife as a surrogate mother for something truly evil, Satan's son. That's right, the cult uses Rosemary as a sacrificial lamb for Satan's grand return through his own offspring, and it is truly terrifying. The general sense of unease throughout the movie is why Rosemary's Baby is an absolute classic and perhaps one of the scarier movies in the horror genre. The horrors depicted on and off the screen aided in the rumor that the film was actually cursed by the cult and summoned demons, with many incidents occurring off screen to the cast and crew, including the slaying of Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, at the hands of the Manson family. Coming in at number three, we have Children of the Corn. Children in horror movies are already creepy, but put them in a cult, a cult composed solely of children, then you have a recipe for absolutely terrifying scares. Children of the Corn, based on the book of the same name by Stephen King, is a supernatural folk horror starring Linda Hamilton and Peter Haunton, and is set in a fictitious rural town of Gatlin, Nebraska. The film tells the story of a malevolent entity referred to as He Who Walks Behind the Rose, which entices the town's children to ritually murder all the town's adults and a couple driving across the country to ensure a successful corn harvest. As the couple arrive in the small, seemingly abandoned town, they discover the congregation of children led by a girl named Rachel, with them performing a cultural birthday ritual for Amos by drinking his blood from a pentagram-shaped cut on his body. Amos has turned 19, therefore is considered old enough for his passing, joining their god in the cornfield. Now, while the movie as a whole was a little disappointing, it does deliver on the horrors of cults. Not to mention there were seven sequels, with the first being far superior. The cult movie in turn gained a cult following, with it being a hit among movie lovers. Coming in at number two, we have Hereditary. One of two Ari Aster movies on our list, Hereditary was a surprise horror movie, with the reveal of its cult being kept a secret for much of the movie, making it incredibly unexpected when it begins to unfold. Released in 2018, Hereditary is Ari Aster's directorial debut, with it starring Tony Collette and Alex Wolfe as a family haunted by a mysterious presence after the death of their secretive grandmother. However, what begins as a sober family drama very quickly descends into a crazy supernatural horror. What begins as a slow burn quickly catapults into a disturbing horror after an incident involving the family's son and daughter, leaving viewers covering their mouths. As a result of the incident, the mother, Annie, is forced to turn to a support group member, Jones, for support, learning ways she can contact the realm of the supernatural. However, this has devastating consequences, with her awakening something that should never have been awoken. Viewers very quickly learn that a demon-worshipping cult are the true causes of 
the family's misery and pain. Worse still, Ariasta plants Easter eggs throughout the movie as a way of warning us of things to come. However, saying that, most of us may have missed these subliminal messages, but what I can say is, the wall-crawling demon was revealed long before the last 30 minutes of the movie, with the cult being there all along, watching the family and waiting for their moment. The cult in Hereditary are worshippers of Paimon, one of Lucifer's most obedient devotees, who rules 200 legions of angels, and is connected to the Tree of Death hence why the treehouse in Hereditary is so important. The summoning of payment is gradual throughout the movie, but when he finally arrives and seeks solace in the body of one of the characters, well, it's enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Midsummer. There are a few things more terrifying than a cult in horror movies. A group of people devoted to a dark high power who will do absolutely anything to appease the deity. No movie displays this as effectively as Ari Aster's Midsommar. Released in 2019, Midsommar is a folk horror film starring my queen, Florence Pugh, and follows a group of friends who travel to Sweden for a festival that occurs once every 90 years, only to find themselves in the clutches of a pagan cult. Now, unlike Ari Aster's Hereditary, Midsommar lays out its intentions from the very start of the movie. The movie kicks off with Danny discovering the death of both her sister and parents, with the instant putting a strain on Danny's relationship with her already distant boyfriend Christian. Not long after, she learns that Christian has planned a trip to Sweden with his friends to attend a midsummer celebration at an ancestral commune, so the group packs up and heads out. Things very quickly descend into madness, with the group arriving and being met by a large group of white cult members in a very peculiar white outfit with Danny realizing that something isn't quite right here. However, her concerns are proven correct when two commune elders die by senicide by leaping from a clifftop. When the male elder survives the fall, the cult mimics his wails of agony and crushes his skull with a mallet. Yeah, things aren't fun in Sweden right now. Now, without ruining much more for those who haven't watched it yet, the cult does what is necessary to summon the dark higher power that they worship, with the American Taurus being used as a sacrifice for the demon. Now, more interesting still, while this movie isn't entirely based on a real cult, director Ari Aster does describe it as a stew of sorts. I quote, we're drawing from actual Swedish traditions. We're drawing from Swedish folklore, we're drawing from Norse mythology. All in all, Midsummer successfully draws on the disturbing conventions of cultist horror to generate a sense of dread and unease, making it my favourite folk horror movie and cult horror movie of all time. 